All technology that humans have ever developed amplify human intent. A knife can kill, a knife can save your life. It can cook food, it can keep you alive. But AI, the public narrative is almost completely dominated by the negative. Whether or not this is a net positive or a net negative for humanity is not a flip of a coin. It is based on what we do. And if more positive intent is put behind, is amplified with AI, then you're going to have net positive. Um, if the good folks just wring their hands and say, we don't want to have anything to do with this, and the, the bad folks, the bad folks are going to do whatever they're going to do, uh, re regulation or not, they don't follow rules, then we're going to be in a bad place. Welcome to The Eric Reese Show. My guest today is Saul Khan, founder of Khan Academy. What started as one man tutoring his cousin in math over the phone after his hedge fund day was over, quickly became a family tutoring network. From there, it just kept growing. A few years later, Khan Academy was launched, and today it has over 170 million users and is available in 50 languages and 190 countries. Saul's a true contrarian. He chose to found Khan Academy as a nonprofit. This has provided advantages that other companies, merely focused on making money by any means necessary, will never have. As you'll hear, avoiding what he calls the very strange market forces around education has been one of the keys to Khan Academy's ability to build deep trust and loyalty. Khan Academy has also been a major early adopter of the new AI. Saul has learned more than almost anyone about how to apply this new wonder to the field of education. But I think you'll find his lessons are widely applicable. As he explains, it's our duty to take a hand in shaping AI's place in our world. If we're open to new technology instead of fearing it, we can avoid the dystopian nightmares so many people have predicted are imminent. For Saul, living a life that reflects everlasting values is truly compatible with embracing the new. Just one of the many lessons he imparted in our conversation. Up next, Saul Khan. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean, the cloud loved by developers and founders alike. Developing and deploying applications can be tough, but it doesn't have to be. Scaling a startup can be a painful road, but it doesn't have to be. When you have the right cloud infrastructure, you can skip the complexity and focus on what matters most. DigitalOcean offers virtual machines, managed Kubernetes, plus new solutions like GPU compute. With a renewed focus on ensuring excellent performance for users all over the world, DigitalOcean has the essential tools developers need for today's modern applications with the predictable pricing that startups want. Join the more than 600,000 developers who trust DigitalOcean today with $200 in free credits and even more exclusive offers just for listeners at do.co slash eric. Terms and conditions apply. The Eric Reese Show is brought to you by Mercury, the bank account I actually use for my startup. I've been around a lot of startups and a lot of fintech products over the years. People often think the way to simplify the complexity of finance is to add layer upon layer upon layer of software and automations and workflows. And all that winds up with is a really complicated mess. Mercury's figured out the thing that really matters, the bank account. If all of your workflows, all of your automations are driven from the place where the data and the money already are, life gets a lot simpler. Mercury simplifies your financial operations with powerful banking, giving you greater control, precision, and speed so you can operate at your best. We all know speed is the ultimate advantage that startups possess. Your bank account needs to speed you up, not slow you down. Apply in minutes at mercury.com and join over 200,000 ambitious startups that trust Mercury to simplify their finances and perform at their best. Mercury is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by Choice Financial Group and Evolve Bank and Trust members FDIC. Okay, first of all, thank you for making time. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I want to talk first off about why you decided to make Khan Academy a nonprofit. Because we're so used to the idea that entrepreneurs are trying to make money. They're building a for-profit company. They're going to take it public one day. That's what, me, what it means to be a valuable company to so many people. You, you know, when you were doing your tutoring, you famously you know, were tutoring your cousin. And then you know, so many other people, you were becoming a YouTube influencer. Like You easily could have taken this in a for-profit direction. Lots of people have built a lot of, made a lot of money on ed tech companies. You felt it was important to be a nonprofit. Why? Yeah, good, good question. Um, if you go back to 2007, 2008, at that point, I had already been working on this project of sorts for three, four years. It had already gotten some traction on the order of 
a hundred thousand folks were using it every month. And when I say it, uh, not only the videos I, were, I was creating on YouTube, but I had a software platform that would give users practice and feedback and there were teacher tools. And that was actually the original Khan Academy. And it still is where we put most of our resources, that whole practice feedback teacher tool aspect of it. And uh, I remember uh, there were folks who reached out. At, at that point, I lived in Silicon. I still live in Silicon Valley. And they said, hey, I'll write the check right now. You can quit your day job, um, do this full time. And it was tempting. And usually that first conversation went really well. And I have I, I have nothing against for-profit companies. My my day job at the time was working at a hedge fund, which is about as for-profit as, as it gets. Um, but there was something about the second or third conversations. And all of these were good people, but it was all around what do you start putting behind a paywall or where could you put ads that won't completely disrupt the education process. Mm -hmm. And I started to think about all of the users who were already benefiting and had the potential to benefit from this, but would not if you started increasing the frictions, if you started putting it behind paywalls. I also thought a lot, my day job, I was a hedge fund analyst. I was talking to a lot of public companies and I thought a lot about how annoying people like myself would make these leaders at these public companies think very short term, re really about mm -hmm. you know the next the next quarter. Uh, there's actually very little incentive in public companies to think more than a few years out. If someone's thinking five years out, they're considered a, a big thinker in a lot of in a lot of places. Um, and I also saw uh, working at a hedge fund that how much your the capital structure influences the decisions you have to make. A lot of for-profit companies are started with a mission in mind, uh, oftentimes a very mission-oriented founder. But by the time you grow and you have a lot of other stakeholders, that mission by definition is not the bottom line. The bottom line is the fiduciary to, to shareholder value, et cetera. And so when, I, when Khan Academy started to become a thing, a little delusional part of me <laughs> said, well, what if instead of Khan Academy, and, and both of these are delusional thoughts. There's a for-profit del delusional dream that every entrepreneur has. It's like, what if this is the next Google? What if this is the next, you know, Meta, whatever, um, which is great, make a lot of money, have a lot of impact. But then an even more delusional part of my brain said, well, what if this is the next Oxford? Or what if this is the next Smithsonian? And that started to really appeal to me because those institutions last hundreds of years, in some cases last thousands of years. and it, it it felt you know a lot of times when I when I'm faced with a decision I'm like what would a and what would a, a protagonist in a in some of my favorite books do <laughs> and I said well you know if, if I talk to Harry Seldon in the Foundation series or uh, he he would have started this as a nonprofit and tried to make the an institution uh, that exists for generations to come and a, and only a nonprofit. If it can last, can it stay true to that mission? Now, nonprofits have their own set of set of uh, mm -hmm. rough spots that we could talk about, but that was that was the thinking. What if Khan Academy could be an institution that could reach billions of people over over maybe not just decades, but hundreds of years? Well, I, I admire and love the long term vision of that and the and the chutzpah really to 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 go live the dream. Why do you think being a nonprofit was the key to being able to think long term like that? I, I think most people would find that counterintuitive. Yeah, you know, there's there's several Harvard Business School cases now on Khan Academy, all kind of linked to this idea. You know, the first one was should Khan Academy essentially be a nonprofit or not? And then some of the the, the cases since then have been around some of our growing pains that we've had, and then you know our pivot now in, in the AI world. But it's, you know, if, if, if we were, if, and I, I even look at some of the, uh, let's call it peer ed tech companies that started, mm -hmm. a few, most of them started a few years after Khan Academy, a few started before. And, and I know a lot of the founders and they, they had similar missions. They wanted to democratize, say, higher education or, or something else. But what happens is, as you start, as soon as you start taking some of the, the venture money, this isn't a bad thing. I think this could be a good thing in many cases. Um, you know, the, the attitude is go big or go home. A um, lot of money, grow fast, even if that creates some cultural growing pains, even if that... Uh, and, and, and then after about two or three years, maybe four or five years, if you have generous investors, they start turning the screws a little bit on how exactly you're going to be uh, monetizing this. Oh, yeah. 
And at that point, it usually involves narrowing the ambitions or narrowing the mission. So some of the the peer groups that you know wanted to democratize higher education or think about free college, they've gone to where the money is, and I don't criticize them for it. They had to as a business, but it's okay. We're going to turn into certifications for for the most part people who already have college degrees but want a specialization in say data science or something like sure. that. That's great. That's creating value for some people, but that they weren't able to stay true to that big mission of what if what if higher education were to look different. And 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 ironically, we are slow but steady. Now I wouldn't say we're we're medium speed or fast but steady where we we're actually maybe in a better position um even though it didn't happen in 3 or 4 years, but we're in a better position now to actually tackle a bit some of these issues around credentialing, uh, not just at a high school level, but also at a career and college level. I think it's a really remarkable thing that you've been able to build. So first of all, just, you know, I'm, I'm full of admiration for it. But I also think it's really interesting that you talked about the inspiration for something like the Smithsonian. You know, Smithsonian is a nonprofit, but it has, you know, incredible revenues every year, creates incredible amount of value in the world. And so, do, so does Khan Academy. So I think it's really interesting. There's this kind of paradox that being nonprofit has allowed you to create more value. And I kind of feel like the implication of that is there's something wrong with the way we're doing for-profit companies. If a for-profit company, you know, supposedly is supposed to be all about maximizing value creation, all about making the most money. What, what do you make of the fact that you've been able to create more value as a nonprofit than you would have been able to as a for-profit? Yeah, and it's a debate. I think you know, I have friends will give me a good argument why Khan Academy maybe would have created even more impact or value as a as a for profit. I'm, Do people I'm really say that to you? Because a lot of our journey has actually been people joining the effort and and that yeah. energy amplifying what we're doing, which I don't think would have happened. Also, uh, you know, people want to be part of it in in a lot of ways, uh, not just from a, a a resourcing point of view, but also from a talent point of view. You know, one of the questions is, could you even attract talent as a nonprofit, yeah. especially in an environment like that? So. We, 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 we've been able to. I, I think for me, it's if, if you were to want to start a new car company, if you want to start um, a, a new, let's call it general productivity software, if you want to you know, I'm in general in favor of of the for profit route, um, and I'm 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 generally in favor of the rapid creative destruction process. I think that for the most part is good for society. I think nonprofits are interesting. Where if you had a super innovative and creative government, it's the types of things that that super innovative and creative government would do uh, because it's a public good. Market forces either don't lead to outcomes. Uh, that are consistent with our values or they just don't work. I think education and healthcare are two areas where the market forces are very strange. The the beneficiary, the payer, and the decision maker are different people, which is not a good setup. And we have values around those both of those areas that aren't necessarily consistent with, okay, if you can afford it, you should get it. It should be like, no, everyone who wants to learn should learn. Anyone who's about to die should get <laughs> should someone should save their lives. Um so so I think those areas where in theory it should be government but um, the government is not likely to be nimble enough or innovative enough. That's where the nonprofit sector could be interesting. But look, I think I'm also very skeptical of nonprofits. At, when I was in business school, they didn't fail anyone at business school, but um, they tell you internally if you essentially would have failed a class. Uh, when I was at HBS, they give you either a one, two, or a three. A three meant you were in the bottom 10% of a class. And the one, the one course that I got a three in was social entrepreneurship. <laughs> What do you know about that? Oh my goodness. That um that's such a great example of of how we try to credential and and you know make gatekeep these things, but actually the people, it's really the misfits and the radicals who who have the good ideas. And yeah, I I I hope you hope you wear that as a badge of honor now. Yeah, I mean I, and well I was you know the reason why I got a little grade in in that class is I was skeptical of a lot of nonprofit efforts. I remember the final exam was about some, you know, bicycle ride that purportedly was going to help cure disease. And I wrote in, on the paper, I'm like, how does this bicycle ride cure that disease? Now, in hindsight, I, I, I didn't realize that the professor is the person who actually created that nonprofit. So that was not a, <laughs> a, a strategic move. But um, but I now I'm, I'm not as cynical about those types of things. I actually think, yes, the, the bicycle ride itself and maybe the money it raises isn't going to necessarily be the 
defining thing that cures the disease, but it builds awareness and it, and it gets people bought into a, into a, into a mission. But I, I think there could be some very negative, just as we were talking about in the for-profit world, people can get very short term, go bigger, go home, sometimes not aligned with our values. In the nonprofit world, sometimes you have the opposite problem where things are not nimble. The nonprofit exists just for the sake of existing. You don't necessarily have as much creative destruction as you should <laughs> in the yeah. nonprofit world. Yeah, we've all we've all encountered those, those yes. nonprofits, and and yeah. it is kind of sad when that happens. Yes. What do you view as the mark of a successful? I don't want to call it a nonprofit. I actually think the way our society thinks about profit is ridiculous. The idea that you and the Smithsonian are not for profit entities. That seems, that seems really backwards to me. This it seems like a lot of value is being created here. So I wish we had different terminology for it. But, you know, this kind of kind of mission driven enterprise, is what I'm going to call it. Um, what do you view as the hallmarks of a success there? Like when someone pitches, people must pitch you now all the time that they want to create the Khan Academy for something else. Um, how do you differentiate between something that's likely to become, you know, a movement like you've built versus something that is more likely to be, you know, one of these kind of sad, self-serving bureaucratic nonprofits? Yeah, I think you have to make a, a strong argument on social return on investment. And there are some frameworks out there. The Robin Hood Foundation, a large foundation out of uh, New York, has a framework. And you know, by their framework, it's sometimes hard to quantify the value that you create. You know, even for-profit companies usually only capture a small amount of the value that they're that they're creating. Um, but you can try to quantify. They quantify it in the education world uh, based on you know some correlations that have been seen between learning outcome improvements and lifetime earning. And that doesn't even talk about things like lowering your chance of getting incarcerated or uh, having to go on social services, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but by but their measure, a good nonprofit would have a, let's call it a 2x, 3x social return on investment. Now, mm -hmm. social return on investments are higher typically than uh, regular return on investments because everyone's trying to get a regular return on investment. So that's much more competitive. So if I told you I had a 30% return on investment as a hedge fund, you're like, okay, how do I sign up if you're, if you're doing that in a, in a low risk way? Um, but Khan Academy, uh, it, it, you know, if you, if you say a nonprofit is at a three X, a typical decent one, a good one is at 10 X Khan Academy in with very conservative assumptions about our reach and our engagement, our impact is about a 500 X. So I think, being able to quantify aspects like that, being mm -hmm. able to measure what you're actually doing. I also think one of our benefits is, it, you know, a lot of times my wife and I were thinking like, oh, you know, we should, we should donate to something in some part of the world. We really care about that. But the world's like, do we really know what they're doing? <laughs> do we really know? If, like, are, is it really going to buy a mosquito net or is it going to be, you know, is it going to line some bureaucrats pocket or who knows what's, what's going to happen with that? Um, and, you know, I think one of the properties that Khan Academy has is that we're hyper transparent, like no one mm -hmm. needs to question what's going on with Khan Academy. They can see it very clearly. They, in fact, most of our donors are users themselves, their children use it. So it's not hard for them to imagine, oh, if Khan, if Khan Academy creates this new course or creates these new features, not only will my kids benefit, in fact, I've already seen my kids benefit, but I can definitely see how these other kids who otherwise would not have access are going to benefit from it. Give us some vanity metrics, like just just brag for a second. How how big is Khan Academy now? Give give us a sense of the the scale, the impact. How big is the team? What what's the budget like? How many kids use it? Just whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, I, I'll share whatever y'all want to know. But the um, and you know, the, I guess the most vanity metric is registered users, which is I think approaching 170 million. Maybe it's a little over 170 million registered users at this point. Um, it's in almost every country of the world, almost every major language. There's 50 plus translation efforts of Khan Academy. That's another thing that would have never happened if we were for profit. You would not have seen a Swahili version of Khan Academy. You would have not have seen a Bengali version of Khan Academy, but those exist. And, and you would not have seen people giving their time and, and donating to make those types of things happen. Uh, so we're, we're proud of that. Um, as a team, we're now approaching 300 folks. I don't view that as a vanity metric. That gives me a little bit of stress because <laughs> we have to think about where where the resource is going to come from. So mm -hmm. we're still predominantly philanthropically supported. We still we do have revenue streams uh, where school districts that are looking to get more support and training, integration with their rostering systems, district dashboards, now AI tools on top of that, they pay us a little bit of extra revenue. Um, but those are yeah, those that's kind of the high level Khan Academy by the numbers. 
it's, it's, it's been it's been a remarkable run. It's been really fun fun to watch you do it. And listen, on behalf of my kids, you know, it's been fun to watch them use the, use the product and get get value out of it. You mentioned the recruiting thing. So so when I hear people talk about for profit versus nonprofit, what kind of company they want to build, build a mission driven company. Very common set of beliefs out there that if you go so if you're you know if you're that mission driven, if you go all the way to being a nonprofit, you're not going to be able to recruit talent. You're not going to be able to raise money. There's you won't be you'll be at a competitive disadvantage because you won't have the discipline of the markets and all this other stuff. But you seem to have kind of judo moved all of those disadvantages into advantages. You know, you were able to, you were saying you were able to hire incredible people. You'd be able to recruit people into this mission. You'd be able to enlist non-employee folks to, to come and do this work with you. Talk about some of those counterintuitive benefits of being a mission-driven organization. Yeah. I remember when I was at a hedge fund, someone forwarded me some research paper that says, you know, beyond a certain amount of, uh, uh, beyond a certain threshold, money doesn't really matter to folks. Um, what really matters to folks is, yeah, they need some money. They need to feel like they have a let's call it an upper middle class lifestyle. They'd be able to go to a restaurant every now and then, have two cars in the driveway, maybe let's call it a, a 2,000 square foot house in a nice neighborhood, go on vacation every now and then and pay for your your, your kids at you know, college. That's kind of you know the, 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 the American dream, so to speak. Um, but be, beyond that, what people really want is a sense of mission, um, intellectually challenging work, and they want to work with other really interesting aligned people. And you know, when I read that when I was at Hedgefund, I was like, that sounds good, but that doesn't seem to be the way the world works. Uh, but when Khan Academy started, for first of all, I made the decision myself. I said, you know what, if I could back in 2008 or 2009, uh, 2009 is when I quit my day job at the hedge fund and I, I was making good money <laughs> then, uh, more money than I needed, frankly. Um, but we weren't independently wealthy. We were saving money for a house. So that was my incentive to stay at the hedge fund. Our first child had just been born. But my wife and I sat down and, and we said, you know what, if we can make enough money, you know, I kind of called it a, if I could make a kind of professor salary and she was mm -hmm. in fellowship at the time, but she wanted to work for the city hospital. She still does work for the city hospital. So she also wasn't like pursuing, pursuing the, the most high paying way to be a doctor. We say like if together we can support a upper middle class lifestyle or even middle class lifestyle in Silicon Valley, that's all we need. Um, everything else is, is, is gravy to some degree. It just kind of helps build our security and things like that. Um, and that was a, a bet I personally felt like taking. And then in those early days when Khan Academy started to get resources and we were out to, to, to hire, I, we were able to find some really incredible people, uh, as good as anyone, uh, as, to come join. Now, even then it was like, well, maybe these are just a few people <laughs> you know, come out of the woodwork. But now that we've hired over the years, I, that paper that came out that I was skeptical of back when I was a hedge fund analyst was 100% right. Uh, like today, Khan Academy, we do pay way better than most nonprofits. Like our board, to their credit, they do not think that working in a nonprofit should be a, somehow a vow of poverty, that somehow you should get paid less if you're doing more important work. <laughs> so so we pay, you know, there are, um, there are folks at Khan Academy making many hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, they're not making millions of dollars a year which many of these same people could make other places, but they are able to, to get that hopefully upper middle class uh, lifestyle. But we're giving them a mission. Um, uh, we're giving them really intellectually challenging work, things that they feel proud of. Um, and, and we're getting a great yield. I, I was just talking to our HR team a couple of weeks ago, and right now we have about an 88% yield on our offers. Um, almost everyone that we give an offer to has another offer from a Google, from a Microsoft, from a Meta. And we have an 88% yield. I remember back in the day, in the early days, Eric Schmidt of Google was um, on our board. And this is when, you know, I was, I, I had never run an organization before, much less a nonprofit. I was like, Eric, you know, any advice you have on recruiting? And he said, well, what's your yield? And after I told him, he's like, we should be taking advice from you because <laughs> we're also throwing stock and we're trying to create all these golden handcuffs and we can't retain and attract people at the same level that, 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 that you are. So, um, yeah, arbiter think, of things to come for Google, sadly. Yeah. Well, yeah, when well, everyone has had to deal with, um, with, with, with when you feel like you're less connected to a mission that you know where you're like, no, that's what, exactly it. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't, and I don't mean to pick on Google in particular. What you already said, the fundamental truth, which is that as these companies tend to grow, they tend to lose that connection to the mission, mm -hmm. and that makes them that puts them at a competitive disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So it's funny to me that the things that they do 
supposedly in service of getting more efficient and being more profitable actually wind up being value allow them to lose this ability to create value you know to re, to retain talent to to inspire customers and, and and the other things that being highly trustworthy gives you and i feel like you've always felt this like special responsibility being in education to be an incredibly trustworthy you talk about a transparent counterparty someone that you can entrust your kids and their you know their education to um talk about just the, the challenge of that how do you ensure that the whole company you know that the whole organization like embodies that ethos especially you know you're you, as you get 300 people now you're at a stage where you can't personally oversee what every single person's doing in every single team um talk about building that internal culture um, where you you know treat the welfare of students as sacred and really put that at the at the center of everything that you do. Yeah, the, the good news is is I think just by definition of who we are and our mission, the people who are drawn to Khan Academy care deeply about those things. You know, that's like the the first thing that they care about is making sure that we're doing the right thing by by users, by learners, by teachers, by yeah. families, etc. I, I would say that as a as a not for profit, it's almost a slight. Um, reverse of it's not so much that I have to put a ton of energy to make sure that our team cares deeply about these issues. It's more that I have to sometimes put energy to make sure that our team doesn't get so fixated on um, an edge case that they're afraid to move forward. You know, yeah. a lot of what we've done with artificial intelligence initially, you know, everyone's like, this is amazing what's here, but what about student privacy? What about uh, these AIs can hallucinate. It's not particularly good at math. Um, what if students have shady conversations with the AI? How do we keep them safe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think left to maybe consensus, if we were a consensus driven organization, we might have said, oh, let's just not do it. You know, it's still not necessarily ready for prime time. But I had to do a lot of evangelizing the idea of like, if we don't do it, it's not that no one's going to do it. It's just that someone who cares less is, is going to do it. They're going to fill that vacuum. And are, are, is the world really better off? So instead of using these as reasons to shy away or not move or, or make the perfect the enemy of the good, let's turn all of these fears into features and, and put something out there that we can really uh, stand behind. So a lot of what I do is just making sure we, we have that tension between some of the stereotypes of a nonprofit mm -hmm, and some of the mm -hmm. stereotypes of a for profit. I, I, every day, and you know, I, I do have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder when people are skeptical, and they're less so now. But especially in the early years of Khan Academy being a um, a nonprofit, will we be nimble enough? Will we be innovative enough? Um, I like to show people: no, not only can we be enough, but we're more innovative. We're more nimble uh, than than a lot of you know a lot of our partners who are some of the big AI providers. If you ask them who's really done a strong pivot unusually strong pivot into AI, they, they, most of them are saying Khan Academy, which is not what you would expect to hear uh, from a nonprofit. No, it's been, it's been really remarkable, actually. I, I want you to dive into that turning fear into features. That Use AI as a case study and talk about just, because you know, Khan Academy has been a really interesting leader in AI and in education. And you've been everybody's favorite demo partner, launch partner. You were part of the, the, the infamous Scarlett Johansson, Sam Altman uh, uh, video. You got him in trouble. Like, you, you know, Khan Academy has been central to so many of these AI provider story. You've had to lean into that. Like, walk us through what that was like. How do you turn fear into features? Yeah, well, it's, it, it, you know, there's certain things where when you see it, it just kind of slaps you in your face that this is like a big deal. Uh, and, and, um, when when Sam and Greg, Sam Altman and Greg Brockman from OpenAI reached out to me in the summer of 2022, and this was months before ChatGPT existed, uh, mm -hmm. and they showed GPT-4, which many folks know, the original version of ChatGPT was not even built on GPT-4, it was GPT-3.5. So when I saw a more advanced model, well before the world had seen it, it slapped me in the face that this is a very, very big deal. And even though it had imperfections, the rate at which it was improving, and now I even realized back in 2022, I underestimated the rate of improvement, oh, yeah. even though I was probably one of the more bullish people on how fast it would improve. I said, this is going to change everything. This is going to create huge opportunities for what we try to do. As a nonprofit, our mission is free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. When we say world-class, it means how do you emulate what a great personal tutor, what a great teaching assistant would do? I always point out Alexander the Great had Aristotle. When we had mass public education, we could not afford that. So we, 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 we had this factory model of education. But Khan Academy, over the last 15 or so years, has tried to approximate what a great tutor would do with things like video, with personalized software, by aiding teachers so that they could personalize for the classroom more. So it was obvious it could maybe get that much closer to approximating it. So, um, 
you know, I, I just really encourage the team to, all right, yes, what you're saying is a real risk. Don't just keep fixating on this. How do we mitigate that risk? Come up with something and don't over design it. <laughs> like if you had to ship something by next month, what would it look like? And then how do we weigh whether it's good enough or not? And so we just started to build and we're still doing that. We still have these debates. Um, but that's, I think, helped give us. Some build examples. The give some examples from those early AI MVPs that you built. What were the fears and what ultimately did you do to mitigate those fears? Yeah, so some of the most obvious things, as soon as anyone looks at any of these AIs, is it could be used for cheating. That's number one risk. What happens if a student wants to have a, for lack of a better word, a shady conversation? It could be a shady cheating conversation or it could be shady something else. They're trying to build a bomb or, you know, do something hateful or talk about something hateful, whatever it might be, or harm themselves. Uh, and so we said, okay, well, these things are pretty easy to prompt. I, actually, chat GPT, uh, the original chat GPT or GPT 3.5 was not that steerable. It actually was not so easy to prompt to be safe. But GPT-4 and onwards, and, and not just from OpenAI, but other models of that same kind of frontier models, you can prompt them to be much safer so that they act as an ethical Socratic tutor, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one layer. The next layer is, per, especially for under 18 users, how do you provide transparency to teachers and parents and potentially the school system itself? If something, well, transparency in general, so that you can report back saying, hey, this is what the kids have been up to. This might be useful to think about as you plan your next lesson. Uh, but also, if a student is saying, I want to harm myself, I want to build a bomb, I want to, that can the AI proactively notify? And that look, this is what a great tutor would do. If I'm tutoring a, a young kid and they want to cheat, I'd say, hey, that's not what I'm here for. But how would you approach the question? Oh, I'll remind you of this formula, but you have to do the thing. And if that student said, hey, Sal, can you help me um, uh, build a bomb? I'd be like, eh, no. And um I would send an email to their mom or to their teacher saying, I don't know if they're just trying to play around or not, but you should look into this. Why are they asking me to build a bomb? So that um, Con, Con, Conmigo does that. Then on, there's a, obviously a whole bunch of data privacy things that a lot of users don't pay attention to on a daily basis. But like we don't want student, important student or, or sensitive student information to leak into the general models. So we've been very careful, careful that the person identifiable information doesn't go, isn't, isn't being used to train by the general model. We haven't done it yet. We might use it for fine tuned training for something that stays within our Khan Academy nonprofit sandbox. Um, uh, but those are kind of our, our, our key guardrails that we've, we've had. And there's, oh, and hallucinations and math errors. We've done a ton of work above and beyond the base models, anchoring it on Khan Academy's content, doing a bunch of, double checks, triple checks to, to just make it a lot better. You know, it, it just occurred to me that the fact that Sam and Greg reached out to you to show you GPT-4, that's also a really interesting consequence of being the trusted party that you were. If you were just another ed tech company, maybe they wouldn't do that. Oh, I, I think that's right. Um, they told me that before they even showed me that GPT-4 demo in summer of 2022, they said, look, we think this is going to be the model that really wakes people up to what generative AI. And you know, as a side note, no one thought chat GPT 3.5 was worth anyone's time. They, they made chat GPT as a whim and it kind of surprised everyone, that, including them, that people paid attention to oh, it. Yeah. Everyone thought GPT-4 was going to be the model that, that woke everyone up. But they said, look, but it might also be a little bit unnerving and scary. So they wanted a lead, they lead or launch with... Uh, trusted partners that could make in a trusted use case that could make use of of this technology. And yes, they they immediately thought of Khan Academy. And I think the trusted side is we're nonprofit and our what we represent, not just as a nonprofit, but hopefully people sure, view but, us but, as but a, being mission driven really more than, than yeah, your, your, your tax the, exempt status is not really the thing that inspires anybody. Exactly exactly. The mission driven and that the trust we've been able to accrue. And then you know, uh, but also capable of making use of it. They didn't go to like Harvard or Stanford. <laughs> those are also nonprofits, but they're like, okay, those are large nonprofits yeah, forever. That, that aren't necessarily going to move move fast. Talk a little bit about what, what results you're seeing from the AI. Like you've had, you, you've had more, more experience now with anybody using AI in an educational context. People, some people are very bullish about that possibility. Some people are quite frightened about it. What have you seen? Yeah, it's, it's still very early days. You know, we, in, we launched in uh, spring of 2023, 
And even that summer, we did some very light internal studies to see what it's doing. You know, at minimum, is it not doing harm? And we got a clear signal that it was not doing harm and a, a slight signal that it was driving a little bit more engagement. Uh, we, we're, we're tooling for some more detailed studies over the next year or two. My intuition is you're not going to see AI dramatically accelerate. You know, Khan Academy pre-AI has 50 plus efficacy studies on it, that if students do this personalized practice for, let's call it 60 minutes a week, that they're accelerating by a pretty large amount, 30, 40, 50% in many cases. Um, I think the AI, you'll, you'll see a marginal impact to neutral impact on the actual efficacy but what you will see, hopefully, is that the AI is driving more engagement. And it drives more engagement, one, as a student is stuck on a question or they're watching a video and they something was said that they, don't, they can have a conversation about it. They can dig a little bit deeper. But also by helping the, stu the teacher engage the student. I, teachers are the biggest engagement mechanic. You can make all the game mechanics you want, but at the end of the day, it's the teacher telling the student to do it that's going to make them do it. And they're using the AI to support the teacher with lesson plans, progress reports, creating assignments, having narrative read of what the students are up to, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think will also drive engagement of classrooms that will then drive those efficacy results. But it's still early. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting user interface things we've discovered. A lot of kids run with it. I would say about 10 to 15% of them, like as soon as they see these tools, they just figure it out and they're off to the races. But I was surprised there's a lot of other students, including students in high school, who they're just not used to being able to have a free-formed academic conversation. Um, and I remember this was a younger group. It was a third or second or third grade class that we were trying this out with. And a lot of the kids were having telling, telling Conmigo weird things. Like it would be a math problem and they would say like, huh, or IDK or, you know, can you say this word, whatever. And the T at first I was like, okay, I I'm so sorry. This isn't appropriate for this age group. And the teacher's like, no, no, you don't understand how valuable this is. They do that to me. They raise their hand and they forget what they were going to say, or they can't articulate their question. Mm -hmm. And now they're getting practice with it. And you could imagine, especially if you're a high school student and you haven't developed that skill of just being able to articulate what you need, who yeah. cares if you were able to learn the algebra or not? That's a more important skill of articulating what you need. We got, uh, there's a, this is anecdotal, but, uh, uh an educator in Florida recently told me how their special needs kids, especially kids on the uh, Asperger's or autism spectrum, they they are using Conmigo more than their peers. Now that could be a double edged sword. You could say, well, does that isolate them more? Um, you know, folks on the or is it a chance to practice those skills? Exactly. And their evidence is it's actually more of the latter that these kids are engaging with Conmigo more than other kids, but they are also based on observation, seeming to get more confident communicating to other people because of it. So that's a, that's a hope that hopefully we can build on. This episode is brought to you by my longtime friends at Neo4j, the graph database and analytics leader. Graph databases are based on the idea that relationships are everywhere. They help us understand the world around us. It's how our brains work, how the world works, and how data should work as a digital expression of our world. Graph is different. Relationships are the heart of graph databases. They find hidden patterns across billions of data connections deeply, easily, and quickly. It's why Neo4j is used by more than 75 of the Fortune 100 to solve problems such as curing cancer, going to Mars, investigative journalism, and hundreds of other use cases. Knowledge graphs have emerged as a central part of the generative AI stack. Gartner calls them the missing link between data and AI. Adding a knowledge graph to your AI applications leads to more accurate and complete results, accelerated development, and explainable AI decisions. All on the foundation of an enterprise-strength cloud database. Go to neo4j.com slash eric to learn more. You know, I, I love your optimism, uh, you know, even in the face of all the uncertainty that that has faced us. Uh, and, and I guess you're, you're used to it now because, of course, I'm, you know, you, having done the impossible, it gives you a certain sense of confidence that what people say can and can't be done is not uh, very likely to be right. I want to ask you about the new book. Uh, I see it right there behind you, Brave New Words on your on your shelf there. You know, it, it's, it's only just come out, so people should definitely check it out. We'll make sure we have a link in the show notes. But to me, just what strikes me about the thesis there is just it's, it's overriding optimism about what's possible in the century to come. Talk about why you wrote the book and, and what you want people to take away from it. Yeah, I, I wrote the book. I mean, when we were under a non-disclosure agreement about two years ago with OpenAI, 
And as I said, it slapped me in the face that this is going to change not just what I do, it's going to change the world. I was like, someone's got to write a book about this. <laughs> and, and it took me a while to get through the open AI lawyers to, to even let me pitch the book to, to other folk. They eventually relented. Um, uh, but it was very, you know, cloak and dagger, top secret stuff, as you could imagine. Oh, sure, sure. Um, That's gotten them in trouble too recently. They, they uh, <laughs> a, little, a little too, a little too much on the secrecy. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, and I'm, I'm used to literally being an open book, no, no pun intended. So it was, it was a new muscle for me. But um, it wasn't just that someone should write a book, but it was also clear that the education establishment was going to struggle with this. And then obviously, when Chat GPT came out, cheating, fear, yeah. You know, it, they they struggled. It, it, it is today an emergency. And at the same time, I said, well, look, AL technology amplifies human intent. There's going to be negative intent. There's going to be lazy intent on the part of some students. Uh, but there could be some very uh, positive intent here. And so let's hope that the baby doesn't get thrown out with the bathwater. So hopefully I or we can show that there's another way to do it. And also I found everything is moving so fast. I wanted to get my own head around it. I wanted to structure my own thinking. I, this is the second book I wrote. The first one was One World Schoolhouse I wrote back in 2011 when Khan Academy was really picking up. And I was skeptical of writing a book back then. I was like, anything I have to say, I just put it on YouTube. Uh, but I, the, the publishers convinced me. And it was a really good exercise of framing mm -hmm. my own thinking about what, what is Khan Academy? Where does it fit into the world? What is personalized learning? What should education of the future look like? What is competency-based learning? And so this time I was less skeptical of writing a book. I was like, this will help me frame my own thoughts. And I tried to write it in a way. Another big fear is you're writing a book about AI. By the time the book's out, it's outdated. But I wanted to write it in a way that shows that that's pretty evergreen. Um, and so far, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty confident that the that that what's written is 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 going to stand at least a you know a reasonable test of time. So what's the thesis? Like, give us give us the main the main takeaway. What do you want? What, when people read the book, what do you want them to take away from it? It's very fashionable these days for folks like you and I to sit at dinner parties and um, have have conversations about what's going to happen with AI. And it's very easy for a lot of folks to like uh, index on the negative. Oh, deep yeah. fakes. Oh, fraud. Oh, authoritarian governments. Uh, you know, and, and look, those are all real risks. But what I the overarching theme of the book, which in some ways transcends education, is all technologies humans have ever developed amplify human intent. A knife can kill, a knife can save your life. It can cook food, it can keep you alive. Um, the same thing is true of fire, the same thing is true of wheel, the same thing is true of the steam engine. Um, this is going to be true of AI. And what's interesting about AI is I've never seen so much hand-wringing on a technology, on a new technology before. Um, every other technology that's come about, you know, the steam engine, Immediately, people said, oh, this could help us with transportation. It could help us with this. And then um, there's probably some people in the military saying, like, oh, yeah, we can make tanks and we can you know, make submarines and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But AI, um, the narrative, for the public narrative is almost completely dominated by the negative. Um, and, and so the, the overarching theme is, look, whether or not this is a net positive or a net negative for humanity is not a flip of a coin. It is based on what we do. And if more positive intent is put behind, is amplified with AI, then you're going to have net positive. Um, if the good folks just wring their hands and say, we don't want to have anything to do with this, and the, the bad folks, the bad folks are going to do whatever they're going to do, uh, re regulation or not, they don't follow rules, then we're going to be in a bad place. We're going to go into a dystopian world. And there are a lot of really good things that AI should be able to do, especially in the education. Um, in the education, you know, I, I, I use the term the, the, the most powerful thing I could imagine doing with AI is if it can improve HI, human intelligence, human potential, if it can give us all a more meaning and purpose. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know the odds of that happening, but I think we have to at least try. If we don't try, it's, <laughs> we're pretty so much, it's definitely know, not going to happen for it's sure. It's definitely not going to happen. No, there must be lots of entrepreneurs, would be social entrepreneurs, educators watching this. Um, what would you like them to do? If you could wave a magic wand and say, look, get off your couch, stop hand wringing. Instead, do this. What do you want? Well, I encourage everyone to just start using things that they're afraid of. <laughs> Whatever the thing is they're afraid of, whether it's AI or not. But since we're talking about AI, yeah, just start using it. Use it in creative ways. Try out new tools. I'm encouraging everyone at the, on the Khan Academy team. A lot of our team has embraced using AI even for their day-to-day -day job. But some people are don't or haven't thought about how to use it. And I'm like, look, it's going to be good for you and good for the organization if you take a little bit of time to just might might slow you down a little bit initially to learn the new tools, but um, 
but but move ahead uh because if you don't especially with this what we're in the world might might pass you by and people say it's, it's gone around the internet you know you won't be replaced by an ai but you could get replaced by someone using an ai um and that's that's what i would encourage folks and if we think broader than ai i, I encourage a lot of folks and i see this and i don't want to be preachy it's not like i figured out how to live the best life etc but you know just always take stock of what you really want and what you really want you know your life to stand for um you know, don't be ashamed if you have certain material needs, <laughs> but, um, but you know, question if they get beyond a kind of a normal level, <laughs> whether you really need yeah. those things oh, yeah. and, and whether you're, whether you're, you're chasing things that you think will fill your soul that won't, and you're ignoring the things that actually will fill your soul. I've wondered if it makes sense because I've looked at those same studies you were talking about before that people's, the, the kind of, uh, marginal returns to extra income kind of, they, they, they cap out pretty fast. And yet I still meet people who are making far more money than those thresholds, doing something either that they hate or that they know or suspect is really bad for the world or is kind of contrary to their values. And they yet they kind of get stuck. They can't get off that that treadmill. I've often wondered if we should have a like a philosophical concept of a maximum ethical salary. It's not like it's not a, you're not required to have it. You know, there's not, no, no law about it, but just saying, look, if you're making money to feed your family. Be, and you're doing it in something you hate. Oh, it's okay. Like I think people put so we like to moralize so much people who have less money, less power. But the people I'm thinking about, I know so many people have got way more money than they need, and yet, and and if they were build, doing it, building something that was really mission driven, and they really they're making the money because their profitability is really lined up with making the world a better place. I think go make as much money as you want. But if you're not able to do that. We need to have some way to say, you know what? I think you should make less. Like, don't you know? You know, take take some time off, or like only work three days a week, or find a way to, you know, go work at Khan Academy. Like, find a way to be doing the things you actually care about that are reflective of your values, instead of chasing the absolute most money that you can make. Does that does that resonate with you? It's, it's so I, you know, I, I'm uh, I wouldn't call it a maximal ethical salary. I'm not against anyone making whatever. Somehow the market's willing to pay them for their time. Um, and you know, many of those people I then go to to be donors to Khan Academy. So I'm not, I'm not to some degree, the only re reason why philanthropy and Khan Academy can exist is because some mm -hmm. people are making much more than than they need, and they're able to they're able to give some of that back to other folks. That's a lot better um, than buying a yacht. That's for sure. No, that's right. That's right. I, I think so. You know, if someone gets paid a billion dollars, ten billion dollars, whatever, to do something, God bless them. That's awesome. Um, I, I I think it's much more of it. I wish it was, or their ways of being in our, in our culture ways of, um, allowing people to reflect better on that balance and then giving them permission. I, I have a friend, a very close friend who's a very senior person at a tech company out here in Silicon Valley making, you know, I know, I know he lives the way I live. He would be very happy, you know, making probably a third of what he makes, uh, but but he's in meetings from you know seven a.m. to sometimes midnight. Yeah, he's oh, not seeing right. his family as much as he Huge likes. And I say, well, you know, you are you're. I sometimes talk. I'm like, yeah, look, you're a senior person. Why don't you just cut some of those meetings out? Why don't you just? And but he can't uh, because, or he doesn't think he can because yeah, he definitely. he thinks it would it would be reflected bad upon you know. Or if he said he wanted to work four days a week, or if he wanted to, uh, he just can't like. In, in theory, from the company's point of view, it would be a deal if they could have his salary and he could work three days a week. Because um, it probably is still going to get done. Yeah, but probably, he'll probably get one hundred percent of the time, output, yeah. and probably he'll stay at the company longer. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's you know so a lot of times when 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 we at Khan Academy, and I want to claim that we have it all figured out, but when we think think about what we're doing for our team, I I literally tell our team. Unless it's an emergency, you really shouldn't be working on on evenings. And I don't say that just to become a nice, just to be a nice guy. I'm saying that because I generally think you're not going to be as productive. You're not going to be creative, uh, and then you're gonna it's gonna water down what you do during the the day, and and or you're gonna burn out, and you're not gonna last years as, as, as long. So I think that you know we've gone full remote, which is a very non standard thing to do as an organization. But you know every every time I go hang out with, especially well anyone. 80% of the people that are complaining that they have to do FaceTime now in the office for two or three days a week. And I say, why? And they're like, yeah, I don't get it. Why? Because most of my team's in this other city anyway. <laughs> right. but because my boss told me I have to My do boss it. Yeah. or my boss's boss or their boss's boss gets some type of psychic reward from seeing people every now and then in their, you know, 
in the parking lot and seeing the traffic <laughs> come into the headquarters, whatever it might be. Um, but I'm like, well, if we can give people a little bit more of their lives back and a little bit more of their time, they're going to be more energized. And, you know, this might sound like touchy feely nonprofit stuff, but I would take our team head to head with any team in Silicon Valley and compare the output, compare the productivity, the, the agility of it. Um, and so I think too many times, especially in Silicon Valley or Wall Street, people think it's a it's a tension between your life and work, yeah. but it, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, people think the way you maximize productivity is you squeeze. Exactly. You, you, know, you exploit to the maximum degree. And, and then you think, chain them to you know golden handcuffs. And it's totally. so psychologically damaging <laughs> for, for yeah, the org well, too. Yeah. We, we talked we talk about this a lot in, in some of these interviews that every time you act in that way, some startup somewhere is high-fiving. You just mm -hmm. created a liability, a competitive disadvantage that they're mm -hmm. going to be able to poach your talent. They're going to be able to take advantage. Whatever you did that you're ashamed of, like you might be able to hide it for a certain amount of time, but the, 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 the damage to your trustworthiness, the damage to your reputation, that's creating competitive openings for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And you know that's true, although very few startups, startups tend to, sometimes are, sometimes they, startups need to be in this like, we're going to work 24 seven type of mindset, but, but sometimes they don't. And they just, you know, just out of pure, pure fear, they act that way. Oh, I've been there. Listen, the code you write at 4am is not very good. You're it is spend, not. You're going to spend four hours the next day taking it out or someone else is going to, you know, two, two months from now. It's, I, I, it's I, you know, very the, counterproductive. The, I give a lot of credit to my former boss at the hedge fund, uh, which is an, un, you know, most people would not think that this is where this philosophy came from. But I remember when I started working at Wool Capital Management, my boss's name was Dan Wool. It was just me and him. He was our portfolio manager. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I was right out of business school. This is 2004. And I remember that first week and um, it was like 4.30 in the afternoon. We were in Boston. And he's like, Sal, you should go home. I'm like, really? It's 4.30. And he's like, yeah, you know, the markets have closed. We, we had a, you know, and, and I'm like, okay, Dan, I'll go work, work from home. He's like, no, 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 no. I don't want you to work. I don't want you to work in the evenings. I don't want you to work at weekends. I'm like, really? Because it completely goes against the stereotype of finance or hedge yeah, funds. Sure. And he's like, Sal, our job as investors is to make a few good decisions every year and to avoid making a bunch of bad ones. And the worst decisions happen when you overanalyze things. You do it in your unproductive time. You, you, you start groupthink. You, you don't have another life. I want you to go do other things. And that, frankly, was what gave me permission to tutor my cousins back in the day that led to Khan Academy. But it, I believe actually we were better investors because of that. Dan's retired now, but if you look at his returns, they would rival Warren Buffett anybody in terms of how good of an investor he was. And he taught me that it, it's not, it's not a, um, it, 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 you can have a life. In fact, having a life can make you a better, a, a leader, thinker, dec decision maker. Yeah, oh, I love that. It's such a critical thing to understand that getting the few things right is so much more important than how many hours you log and the decisions you make under duress when you're tired, when you're, you know, on your 90th hour of the forced death march. Those are not good decisions. And you stress right. other people out. I mean, you if, if other I guarantee out, you, I have never written trauma in the world instead of healing. I have never written a good list. email at 10 p.m. I, I now reflect, I have never once written a good email. Everyone in hindsight, I'm like, oh, I wish I said a little different. I usually did say it from a point of stress. I stressed out a bunch of other people and worked them up, wasted a lot of time. Never a good email. Uh, now, if I do want to write an email, I'm like worked up about something. I do the delay send and nine times out of 10, I wake up in the morning and I'll delete it before it gets, <laughs> it gets totally, sent oh, out. I, so really, I really remember that feeling of inbox anxiety when it's like, God, what? I'm afraid even to check my email because I don't know what kind of crazy missive mm -hmm. my boss will have sent me, you know, in the middle of the night when they were stressed out about something else, taking it out on me. So, yeah, I think that's that's good advice. All right. You got time for a lightning round? Sure. OK, just a couple couple quick ones. because I just I, I you, you got so many great quotes you've given over the years and so many great ideas you've put into our total consciousness uh, as a society. Um, one is you, you said you teach the way that you wish you were taught. What does that mean? One, it's um, there's a certain notion of respect. I've always enjoyed teachers who didn't treat me as inferior to them. They treated me as their equals uh, and just someone who doesn't understand it yet. Um, so that tone is very, very important. I have also always responded to folks who don't say, look, just take my word for it that A leads to B, that is open to questioning or that can give you the intuition. Um, I've always responded to people who are willing to be very vulnerable and transparent with their thinking. Like, you know what? 
I had trouble learning why A leads to B. These are the questions that I had. And honestly, I'm still a little assure, unsure whether it's always B or not. That opens up. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, if the if the instructor or the tutor is not truly passionate and excited about what they're doing, there's no way that the student is going to be. And if they're not relaxed and having fun, then there's no way that the student isn't going to be, re is going to be relaxed and having fun. So yeah, that's it. Focus on the intuition, be approachable, um, have fun, um, don't, you know, and, and, and speak as an equal. You also, I think in the book, talk a little bit about an idea, I think you attributed to Plato about that learning under compulsion is wrong. Like you shouldn't try to force people to learn things. They should want to bring their mind to it on their own. We have a very, very bizarre inheritance in our civilization of hierarchical learning methods where the student is passive. And, you know, we have this meta factory metaphor of cramming them full of knowledge and stamping them with a certification out the door. Just, just talk about like to you, what, what does it mean? Like in a deeper way, why should people not be forced to learn, but, but what's the alternative to that? Yeah. Well, you know, pragmatically, I, the ideal is someone who is, who is, hungry for knowledge and you're feeding that hunger. Uh, but I do think that there's some some compulsion might be necessary <laughs> just to, you know, as a parent and and I'm also, you know, in I a school I helped start and I'm now the chairman of. Like you you definitely need to create some guardrails and some nudges for students. And a lot of what we're doing even on the AI work, we realize that a great tutor doesn't just wait to be asked. A great tutor nudges students forward and is proactive. That's what I was doing with my cousins 20 years ago. I would call them up I was like, look, I'm taking out the time. You need to take the time. Or I would sometimes call their parents. It's like, they can't go to this party unless they do this with me. So that was a little bit of compulsion. Um, but I think if it's nothing but compulsion, then I think something is broken. Um, it's it, it, As I point out, all four-year-olds, I have never met a four-year-old who is not curious, who will they'll literally, the, if you think about the, the reason why most four-year-olds will ever throw a tantrum, it's because they aren't allowed to explore something. Um, and then those same, so when people say, oh, that's good for curious kids or motivated, I'm like, well, all kids are in that category. So there's something about, you know, these classrooms that are based on this factory model where you have to be passive and finger on lips and you're not allowed to interact. I and mean, most people learn by talking and doing and, 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 and you're literally forbidding that in a classroom. That's where I think you, you really stamp down a lot of people's, um, curi curiosity, more, you know, compulsion is okay in moderation. I think the most important thing is, is that there, you should be trying to do active learning as much as possible, not passive mm -hmm. learning. Yeah. And nurture people's curiosity rather than stamp yeah. it out of them. Even if it's slightly inconvenient to you, the adult authority figure. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's a whole, don't ask me a question. I mean, how, what a horrible signal that, you know, that's, and, and the best is, and if you should ask me a question and I should be very honest with you if I don't know the answer. Right. Right. Teachers should be modeling that that's actually a great thing. Mm -hmm. Like one of the most important skills is to be able to admit when you don't know something. Exactly. What, a, what, a, what an opportunity to model what real humility and lifelong learning looks like instead of it's this more authoritarian model. All right. I'm going to ask you this last question. You talked about how you were, you were thinking about when you're making the transition from hedge fund into, into Khan Academy, you thought to yourself, what are the great, what would the great characters in literature do what would they do in a situation like this? Like how, you know, that was like a way of thinking about it that I thought was really interesting and really literary. You mentioned Harry Seldon, but of course, like my mind immediately went to Dune and Frank Herbert, I guess, because Dune's having a bit of a cultural renaissance these last couple of years, which has been, which has been great. Obviously a book that meant a lot to a, a lot of us growing up, you know, but, but really like, you know, the idea of the incredibly epic actors and institutions created on a very long-term horizon. So much part of that story. I'm curious I know you've talked about that being a book you really liked. Like, yeah, tell me a little bit about the characters that you wanted to be like when you were thinking about trying to create something really long term. And, and did I get it right? Is Dune an example of the kind of thing you had in mind? Yeah, well, I, I'm afraid to say that I'm inspired by Dune because I don't, I don't want to claim that I'm a messiah of any kind. <laughs> well, but, and the danger, <laughs> and the dangers of that is also really interesting. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but the, you know, any, any, any story that we all love and that we identify with the characters are are surrendering themselves to a big a mission much larger to themselves and um there is something very profound that happens and look i i have i spend a lot of time still thinking about okay my kids college i probably the number that i need in my bank account for me to feel secure keeps going up um <laughs> probably irrationally. Um, 
but I yeah. just I just keep reminding myself that like life is short. We're all going to die, um, probably sooner than we expect, maybe you know, or in, or in ways that we don't expect. And who cares about all this other stuff that we spend most of our time like fixating on? Yeah. And we're we're all and we're all protagonists in in our own story. And what do we want that story to be? And you know, it would have been a pretty boring story if uh, Bilbo Baggins only thought about his four hundred one k the entire time. Like he he took he took went out of his comfort zone. And adventures are uncomfortable. Like that's what makes an adventure. You know, that's what I remind myself mm-hmm. when I have moments of stress. Um, I say, look. This is what makes it an adventure. Enjoy it. <laughs> like this is, you know, it has to be within reason. Uh, and don't tie your identity to the outcome here. Just try to do what you can and and let the chips fall where they do. But the um I, I encourage people to think that way because we all love those movies and and but then sometimes don't live that way. That's a great note to end on. Uh thank you for making the really epic choice. You know, because I think how different the world would be now if you decided to stay at stay at the hedge fund. Really glad you chose chose to do it the way that you did. And yeah, on behalf of what is it, 170 million children, like thanks thanks for doing what you're doing. Oh no, thanks for having me, Eric. You've been listening to the Eric Reese Show. Special thanks to the sponsors for this episode: Digital Ocean, Mercury, and Neo for J. The Eric Reese Show is produced by Jordan Bornstein and Kiki Garthway. Research by Tom White and Melanie Rehack. Visual design by Reform Collective. Title theme by DP Music. I'm your host, Eric Reese. Thanks for listening and watching. See you next time.